And welcome once again to the Liberty Lounge, where we talk about faith, firearms, and a little bit of fun. I'm joined to my left by Jared of Guns and Gadgets. He's waving at y'all that are on the podcast and not watching. And also, of course, out in California is my friend Anthony, the armed scholar. He's waving as well. Super excited. We have a special guest today. It is the fat electrician, Nick himself. Y'all know him. Massive, massive following. Nick, I want to open with this question because people are following you. Like people are paying attention to what you're doing. Why? Why do you think you have struck a chord talking about history? Uh, I think it's just the tone that I use. Uh, people usually talk about history. They make it boring. They focus on uh, what I what I would consider kind of irrelevant details, like very specific dates, very specific like specs. Whereas I kind of come at it from an angle to humanize it. I'm trying to tell the story from a singular person that was on the ground that day and what their interpretation was and how that would have felt. And uh, along with that, I think a reason I'm really successful is I kind of appeal to everybody. I appeal to more people on the right and left than you would suspect. And I think the reason for that is um, when I tell a story, I'm very, I'm, I'm pretty anti-government overall, or I have a tone of like the government's kind of dumb. And I feel like everybody kind of agrees with that, regardless of where you land on the political spectrum. And I'm just siding with the men fighting the war, not necessarily the reasons the war is being fought. And I think everybody, everybody wants to support the troops and support veterans. And I think that's just the right tone to have for that. So I think that's a big part of why I've been so successful. Uh, plus one of the reasons we're in all these wars is because the government sucks anyway. So I don't know. Exactly. Like them. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, as things have, you know, I've been watching you from afar a little bit and we've got a lot of mutual friends, actually um, Mike over at CMMG hollered at me this morning. And it's funny because he posted your face yesterday and I have watched a lot of things really blossom for you over the last year. What is a door that's open for you with your newfound? I mean, we're all, I, I guess, micro celebrities. If we're, that's the dorkiest thing I've ever said. But it's really kind of cool when you do this thing and you get in front of a camera and doors open. Have you ever had a moment where you just said, pinch me? I can't believe this is happening. Uh, man, it's tough. Um. I guess I did. Uh, so I'm a host on the unsubscribe podcast now. So, I mean, that within itself is kind of cool. I, uh, I got invited out about a year and a half, two years ago. I was pretty, pretty new to doing this and, uh, they invited me out. I ended up getting one of their most viewed podcast episodes. So I went on a couple more times and eventually I was in pretty much all of their top 10 episodes. So when, uh, one of the other hosts stepped aside, uh, I was kind of the natural pick to fill in that void. So I got to fill in there. So that, and, and that of itself is pretty, uh, pretty incredible to become a host of such a big podcast so quick. And then uh, the unsubscribed podcast actually just did a live tour about two weeks ago. And we went to uh, four different cities, sold out the theater in every single city doing live podcasts with 500 people watching. So that was pretty awesome walking into a room with 500 people that already like you and they're cheering and they know all your inside jokes and they just want to hang out with you and your buddies drinking beer. So What's, what's that like? Because I mean, making content, it's all different. You know, when you make short form, long form, whatever on YouTube, where it's a more traditional scripted, you know, research video that you make, then you're doing the unsubscribe podcast, which is a little bit more just having fun talking super long form. And then you go to doing live events. What's that like? Because I know in my head, like every time I make a certain type of content, it's completely different. The mindset's different. The podcast here, how we approach it is different than what I do on my main channel. So what's that like? Uh, I mean, I've, I've performed in front of live audience before, like I've done stand up comedy and stuff. So it wasn't that, it wasn't that big of a deal for me. And then we had, a another one of our friends, rich angry cops. He was one of the guests for our first episode and he's performed a lot live. So he was there to help. And then I'd performed live a little, but, um, I think there was some nerves the first time, but honestly, like the lights are shining at you. You don't really see the crowd. You just hear them laughing. So, I mean, if anything, it just helps the podcast go better because then you know whether or not your joke landed. And, I mean, you five, ten minutes in, you forget there's 500 people looking at you. So, it's it wasn't a great change, honestly. So, so all four of us do similar things. Like, we're all content creators and multiple facets. And we know we all know the schedule and how much it takes – on us and our personal lives and our relationships. What do you do to get away, brother? Like, wh how do you clear your mind? How do you, how do you relax and kick back? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that is the correct I'm, answer. <laughs> I've only been doing it for a year. I, I really don't. Um, I mean, 
yeah, it's my full-time job. I, I work, you know, like 80, a hundred hours a week, but me working is me listening to audio books and writing down notes and learning something. And like, I can do that while I lift weights. I can do it while I'm doing, you know, stuff around the house or so. I don't know. I guess I don't really stop, but I mean, I don't, I don't really need to unwind from reading history books. I like doing it anyways. So I got really lucky. Speaking of history books, uh, there's there's a lot to be said in education K through twelve or or post secondary education. Where do you think the education system in post secondary is getting it right? Because there's a lot of alternative history now. There's a lot of folks that are rewriting. There's when you go into an American history before the Civil War, after the Civil War courses, they are hitting that. There's activists and nationwide. There's activists that are skewing. I have students that come into my classes and they will on on day three, four, five, I can tell they've been the history class and they're already skewing how bad America is. Is there anywhere where you think we're getting it right in teaching history to young people at this point? Um, I mean, the early stuff is fine. I think once you start getting into like seventh, eighth grade high school, I think is when you really start to see the skewing. And I don't think it's the fault of uh, K through 12 teachers now. Um, you, you have to realize all of history is skewed. I mean, it's written by people. Everybody has an opinion. They're going to lean it one way or the other, whether they're going to admit that or not. Uh, nobody's infallible. So history is always going to be skewed. It's just a matter of how far it's getting skewed and why. Um, and as far as American history goes, there's the general sentiment of, uh, I call it America bad ever since basically everything after world war ii has been america bad and that's where the overwhelming sentiment that um you see people in comment sections anytime you say anything positive about america they well america hasn't won a war since world war ii or uh, america's never fought a just war since world war ii and that's all because of the simple fact of the in academia there was literally an entire group of historians right after world war ii they're actually called the revisionists like that's what they're referred to as and their entire goal was to basically paint America as not being a force for good in World War II. And it didn't work out because there was so much overwhelming information. And the majority of the country had fought that war. They'd been there. They'd seen it. Like, you can't lie to somebody about what they saw with their own eyes. Um, so it didn't work out. But what they did accomplish is this is the reason why most people and why it's not taught in school today how horrific the things that the Jap Imperial Japanese did in World War II. Because the revisionist historians focused all their efforts on basically playing up that Japan was a victim of nuclear bombs that uh, they didn't deserve and America was the bad guys for doing that. And they don't get into like, it was literally the best of three horrible options. And pretty much any historian will agree to that, including like top Japanese historians have agreed to that as well. They said it would have been worse for Japan had America invaded the mainland. And um, so their, their goal to make America the bad guys after World War II didn't work out. But what they did accomplish was um, depriving normal education of like the horrors of what the Japanese did, which was just as bad as what the Nazis did. Japanese did horrific things to the Chinese, all of Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Guam, Thailand. They did horrific things to any POWs they got their hands on. Um, and all of that's kind of deprived because these historians wanted to paint America as the bad guy. And then after that, it, that's why every war is just painted as extremely negative and America has lost it. Um, so, yeah. Boys and girls, what uh, the what the I think the word is communists, the revisionists are communists, whatever it takes to take down America or make us look bad. Heaven forbid we talk about the Japanese comfort girls and the atrocities that they did to their own people. Yeah, that's that's a lot. That is a lot to look and, and say, uh, how can we twist what is what has gone behind us? Um, let me ask you this. What and I'm a, I'm a conspiracy guy. Y'all know this. I love tinfoil hats. I love talking about things that might be we're going to end with a question mark. It's not a period. This is not definitive. This is just for fun. Only for fun, Nick. Peruvian face peelers. We're not talking about <laughs> Peruvian face peelers, but if you'd like to talk about Peruvian face peelers last episode of the Liberty Lounge. Are there any stories as you have dig and you dig and you watch, you know, you watch, you read, you listen, and you dig further into American history more and more and more. And I deep dived your channel recently and you're deep diving the good stuff. Like there's stuff out there. Do you see threads 
where possibly the government's lying to us, where possibly not all is what the White House says it is. Are you, as you go further, does your tin hat, tinfoil hat get thicker or thinner? Uh, <laughs> tinfoil hats don't work, I guess would be the answer to that. Um, you can look at, uh, like this isn't even an ending with a question mark. I mean, it's, you can verify and prove that the the government, not necessarily the White House, but the U.S. government in World War II would suppress certain news from getting published. And as time went on, that became more and more difficult to do. Um, and you can't suppress anything anymore because everybody's got a 4K camera in their pocket and they can upload it to the Internet for the whole world to see. So we're in a new era now where the government doesn't necessarily suppress things or hide things. Uh, they just have to flood the market with bullshit so nobody can tell what the truth is. And, and that's just Vegas that's where we're at. What's that? Unless it's the Vegas shooting, because we still don't have that stuff. You know that Paddock <laughs> carried all of that gear up there and lifted out an 800 pound window by himself. You know he did that. Yeah, and he shot out two corners all by himself. You know what I learned recently is that tinfoil hats don't work. Boo, Nick. Boo. <laughs> See, dude, that's what they want you to think. More of an armadillo hat kind of guy, if we're being honest. <laughs> They can block yeah. even the most powerful brainwave scanners. <laughs> all right, you're sitting in front of your safe. It's a, it's a question that we talk about on here all the time. Right now, what's what what are you carrying? What's your EDC right now? A lot of us we change things out day by day by day. But what's one of the setups you're currently carrying? Uh, I either carry a Sig Macro or a Springfield Echelon, depending on the day. Echelon, interesting. I like it, it a lot. I want to jump back to something because yeah, what we were kind of talking about resonated with me. So I don't know if a lot of people know this about me. I, my undergrad uh, degree was actually in history. So I have a bachelor's in history, which is why I appreciate what you do on your channel, because I think you're more focused on the storytelling of history versus when I went to undergrad in UC Santa Barbara and did all their history courses and got that degree. A lot of it is exactly what you mentioned. It's focused very much on names, dates, and the facts that the professor wants you to know so that when you take their exam, their midterm, their final, you regurgitate exactly the narrative that they want. And you just tell it back to them and you just want to remember those facts as, as precise as possible that they told you. And I think I heard recently on one of the unsub podcasts when I was listening that you've gone and you're getting your bachelor's in history. Is that correct? Oh, God. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I wanted to dive into this because... Oh, I had a boy. lot of frustrations with the education system or the higher education system, specifically in the history departments. And I just wanted to hear some of your thoughts on that because, you know, I, when I got my degree, that my undergrad degree, that was back in, fuck, when, when, when I don't even remember now, 2014, I think I graduated um, in undergrad. Uh, there was a lot of liberal narratives and a lot of things that they pushed on people uh, as far as the history department. So I'm curious, like, you know, kind of what you're facing now going through that process, especially since you already have, I would consider a black belt in history based on what you do on your channel. And so now you're jumping into the education system and dealing directly with them. Uh, yeah. First of all, they don't want you to have the ability to learn for yourself and they get yeah. mad at you if you do. Um, I, what, one of the things that I learned immediately going back to college is there's a very low tolerance for anybody that comes up with original ideas or reads things and interprets them for themselves instead of reading somebody else's interpretation and accepting it for fact. And what I mean by that is the amount of times that I would write a paper and the teacher would dock me points or I would have to go and have a conversation with the teacher because I didn't cite where I got my in the interpretation of my paper the idea that i ran with then like constructed my paper around i didn't cite where i got that idea well it's my fucking idea like i came up with that idea and they're like i find that hard to believe i'm like why isn't that the whole goal of why we're fucking here like to look at a document interpret it and then be able to recite it and explain it to somebody in a more watered down simplified term they're like well yeah but you're an undergrad you're not qualified to do that yet and i go i I'm not trying to be a dick. I have 16 million hours of watch time on my history YouTube channel. I've taught more history than most history teachers ever will in their entire lives. Yeah. Like I feel like I'm qualified to read something and then recite it back to somebody, but they get mad at you when you do that. So, I mean, there's that right out of the gate. 
Um, as far as liberal narratives, absolutely. Some of the books that I was required to read, um, I've gotten horrible grades on papers because yeah. I've shredded the books apart and I'm not qualified to argue against the points made by somebody that has their doctorate in history, even though their points were garbage. Yeah. Um, I, there was a book that was written um, and, and it pisses me off because I, I come at this from the, the human side, you know, and this book was, uh, it was about black soldiers in World War II. And in World War II, what most people don't realize is the country segregation from state to state and the degree of racism experienced in state to state was vastly different in the 1940s. Like living in upstate New York and living in Mississippi were two very different experiences for an African-American. And that's what the book was about. And it was a really good thing to focus on. It was a great topic. And he had a lot of great stories of the shit that these men had to go through and they became heroes anyways. And a lot of that was a great story. But then when he's not just retelling the story, his entire angle with the book is America bad on top of it. And I don't know. It's just shitty. It was basically a hit piece on that entire generation of Americans. And I basically called that out and got an F on my paper because I apparently missed the point. And uh, my argument was uh, the, the author's argument was that we need to, and I quote, retrain our lens on the greatest generation. And my counter argument was they're not the greatest generation because they were perfect. They're the greatest generation because that was the turning point of when all that shit started to end. And apparently that was an F on, on paper in history class. So yeah, this yeah. is the Liberty that, Lounge where we talk about firearms, freedom, fun, and apparently F's in history. Also the greatest generation um, didn't just stand up to racism. They also stood up to the freaking Nazis. I kind of like that as well. Today's episode is brought to you by blackoutcoffee.com. I started my day with Brutal Awakening. Jared, what did you start your day with? 1776. 1776. Anthony, what did you start your day with? 1776, because that's all I have right now. That is all he has, but he can Jared, get more. I need more. <laughs> I need I know, more. Right. He can get more at blackoutcoffee.com slash liberty. And good news, 20% off your first order with code liberty. How exciting is that? Nick, let me ask you this. As you've been going through all of your studies, what's been maybe one of the bigger surprises, like things that you're like, all right, I never heard this. Like there, there's some stories out there in the American in the American tale, mind-blowing things that, that like, that don't get talked about. We talk about the typical stuff. We talk about custard's, custard's last stand. We talk about the basics of all the wars. We talk about basics of politics. What has punched you between the eyes that you've learned? You're trying to get me to talk about the cheese caves again, aren't you? Yes, I am. Oh, my God. Oh, you guys know about the cheese caves? I do don't. Tell. Do tell. You don't? You don't? Let I me do tell not. you a story. America yeah. has a series of cheese caves in 38 different states, the biggest of which is in Springfield, Missouri. And America has 1.7 billion pounds of cheese in an underground cave network. Survival. You want to... No, <laughs> not, not, just... not, even, not even close. <laughs> During World War II, oh, fuck, we're going to go all the way back. Uh, prohibition happened, right? And overnight, every bar in America got told by the government, hey, you're not allowed to sell alcohol fucking figure it out if you want to stay in business so a lot of the bars turned into soda parlors and ice cream shops okay so for the entire generation of men and women that fought in world war ii served in world war ii their social alcohol was ice cream because people didn't go to the bar to see their friends they went to the ice cream parlor right so ice cream is huge and that's why even today every naval ship has an ice cream machine on it it's a naval tradition for that reason so in world war ii they really valued having ice cream. Uh, you had pilots that would get dry ice cream and they would uh, start mixing it and they would put it in a, an ammo can and throw it out the back of their bomber and go fly on a bombing run and then fly back. And then the wind would chill the ice cream enough that they could have ice cream when they landed back at the base. Uh, so ice cream was a huge deal. Lieutenant Dan, ice cream, ice cream, yeah, Lieutenant Dan. 100%. So ice cream was a huge deal, and the United States military was like, okay, cool. Well, refrigeration is now readily available in the 1940s. For the first time ever in human history, we can have uh, the opportunity to have a farmer whose sole job 
is to make a bunch of milk. Like this dude can just have milk cows. We'll transport it. We have refrigeration. We can do that now. Before this, it was just like, oh, this guy's got like five cows. He helps out these 50 people, whatever. Um, so the U.S. government basically approached these farmers, encouraged them to become exclusively dairy farmers, and basically propped up the dairy industry as a whole right out of the gate to help get ice cream and dairy products for World War II. Uh, so that went fine for a little while. After World War II, it kept going fine because America was sending a ton of aid to East Germany and Japan and uh, a bunch of other places in the world. By 1949, everybody was kind of starting to get back on their feet after World War II, and there was this dip in the dairy market because a lot of the U.S. military disbanded. Uh, there just wasn't as big of a need for dairy consumption anymore. So basically the u.s government had two options they could let the dairy industry implode but they felt partially obligated because well they were they started the whole thing um so they said fuck it we'll buy all the milk and if you're a dairy farmer that's had about three years of recession because people aren't drinking milk and the government says hey we're gonna buy all the milk you have no matter what you make as much milk as possible so now they have even more milk and it just keeps coming in the government doesn't know what to do with it so they're like okay well we'll turn it into cheese so it lasts, it doesn't expire, and then we'll stick it in this cave network in Springfield, Missouri. And then that just went on for the next 30 fucking years. Every time a new president comes into office, like, oh, by the way, we're spending $10 million a month buying milk, turning it into cheese and sticking it in an underground cave in Springfield, Missouri. And by the time that Reagan got into office, it was, what, like 1980? When did Reagan get in? Anyway, 80. Whatever. Okay, yeah. So Reagan gets in, and by that point in time, we're spending over a million dollars a day just in refrigeration to keep the cheese from going bad. So he comes in, and he's like, we can't do this shit. So he has his press secretary go into the White House press room with a moldy block of cheese, and he's like, hey, at this point, we had like 800 million pounds of this shit. We just want to throw it in the ocean and get rid of it. What do you guys think? And they're all pissed off. They're like, no, you taxed me money, took my money, turned it into cheese. Give me the fucking cheese. So the Reagan's like, fuck, fine. So he goes, he cuts all the cheese up into five pound blocks, wraps it in brown wax paper. And that's where government cheese came from in the 1980s that we were giving out with food stamps and, and you know, like um, whatever. We were giving it out, selling it super cheap to everybody. And uh, that's where government cheese came from. And that went on until Clinton, Clinton era. And, uh, and then in the 1990s, the U.S. government kind of got out from underneath all the cheese and kind of under big cheese <laughs> yeah they did so that now all the cheese caves are mostly privately owned by like Kraft and Velveeta but like that should be where, where the story ends but what the fuck did the government do to get out of that problem uh, do you know no <laughs> I'm sure it's great okay what th okay okay how old are you guys 48 I'm 50 I'm right. 32 right, you got Okay, I'm a little bit younger than you guys, but I'm sure I'm sure you'll get it. What is the biggest, most successful ad campaign? The most iconic ad campaign that has ever existed in our lifetime. It was Got they had milk? post. Yep, isn't it fucking weird in hindsight that uh, you know, Got Milk isn't a brand? Who was paying for all those fucking milk advertisements? Yeah, you were. Us. Right. So the U.S. government. The USDA founded a nonprofit agency that was an offshoot of them called DMI, Dairy Management Incorporated, and their entire re their entire purpose for existing was to get people to eat and drink more dairy products. And it's a uh, it's not a conventional nonprofit; it's a government checkoff program, meaning that every dairy farmer in America, from the minute they were founded until modern day, is required to give money to this ad agency to do ads on behalf of the dairy industry. And uh, that's where all the money from that came from. So the United States government literally funded a psychological operation to convince Americans to eat and drink more milk. So like everything that's happened in our lifetime that involves too much cheese, it all goes back to DMI. Uh, in 2012 or 2014, when Domino's was about to go bankrupt, they gave them $18 million and then gave them a bunch of free cheese to stay in business. They're the ones that came up with the idea for stuffed crust pizza. They're the ones that got uh, Taco Bell to do steak and cheese quesadillas. They are constantly working behind the scenes to do anything they can to get people to eat and drink more milk. I will give for them the pass a... for stuffed crust. I mean, I will give them the pass. <laughs> stuffed crust pizza. <laughs> for a non tinfoil hat wearer, you're sure making a great argument for puppeteers pulling the strings. Bro, it's hilarious. 
<laughs> I've uh, so I have this I have this theory on my channel that uh, everybody's worried that artificial intelligence is going to take over the world, you know. But they're thinking like Terminator, Skynet, metal robots, and shit. Uh, I think artificial intelligence already has taken over the world. It's just bureaucracy. Because I would argue the minute you get like 50 people together, you give them one purpose and tell them nobody's ultimately responsible for what you guys do just to accomplish this task. That's artificial intelligence. Because once bureaucracy takes off, it'll fight to preserve itself. You know what I mean? Like you can start a government foundation with the purpose of doing something helpful. But if at any point in time that becomes not helpful, that government agency will fight against the human quality of life just to preserve itself. So the people there don't lose their job. Like we've already been taken over by artificial intelligence. It's just not what we conventionally think of it as what? Learn something every day. I mean, with all the things we so, just talked about, what, what did you go into YouTube for? Like you probably could have done so much more. What, what do you mean? Like you, you would hear people say like, maybe you should have uh, gone a professor's route or, some type of online teaching type stuff like is is that ultimately like you want to work more of that stuff into uh america yeah by I, I have a question YouTube about that like why why the hell go back to school like me yeah. as someone who has a history degree and i see what you do and i'm i'm hearing you tell stories that are history wise so much more interesting than anything i would ever hear when i went and sat at these stupid courses and listened to the professor lecture why the hell go back and get the history grades? Is it just as a big middle finger to the academia uh, itself who's telling you can't talk about certain things or, or, or what, it, you know, what is that motive? Uh, no, I think originally when I started going back to school, it was a big part of like, I wanted credibility, but uh, the more I get exposed to people that have credibility, the less interested I become in having it yeah. because I don't really think it means anything anymore. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten in arguments with somebody with more credibility than me that is, can't back up what they say and then just rely and have to lean on that magical sheet of paper they have to say, well, I'm right because I have this, not because I can prove it. And that just doesn't interest me. I've also gotten to the point where I've taken every history class available, but I'm still like a bunch of credit hours short but yeah. I can't take history. You got to take, well, take a math course and some other bull crap. To it's have not even like, I don't even mind math. It's just the humanity gauntlet that I'm supposed to go through and the bullshit that I'm supposed to listen to. And, like, I don't have the mentality to sit there and have you explain to me some fucking nonsense and not push back on it. I, I can't do it. Is it this all online nuts. or are you have to go in person too? Uh, it's it. I do mostly, I try to just do online, but it's still, it's awful. And like, even, Oh, God, I'll give you a great example. I had a, I had a history class about the, um, how do I explain it? Like the, the birth of society. So, you know, you had like the Indus Valley, ancient Egypt and uh, ancient China were like the first civilizations. And we're in this history book and we get to the portion where we talk about the Black Plague, the bubonic plague, right? And the question on my homework, where you have to like write out a paragraph or whatever, what was the cause of the bubonic plague and how did it spread so fast me history nerd in the back of my head i'm like well the bubonic plague was spread by fleas yeah fleas can jump really far and at this point in time everybody was either nomadic or they were like p farmers that were in poverty living in close proximity to animals and if you're nomadic you also live in close proximity to animals so it's just natural that you know people are around fleas all the time they get bit by fleas you get the bubonic plague the end right that makes sense uh, I'm not shitting you. I probably have it in the highlighted in the history book. I'm not going to grab it, but it was uh, all the history book said and what the answer on the homework, what they wanted you to say was, I'm not shitting you. Many historians believe that the bubonic plague spread so fast due to climate change because there was a mini ice age during this period that lowered the temperature several degrees on average, which would in turn lower everyone's immune systems, allowing the bubonic plague to spread faster. <laughs> I just lost brain cells. I, that I was mean, like COVID thirteen. <laughs> I wouldn't even be mad if that was like a like a, a a sub paragraph where they were like, "Hey, it spread by fleas. They were the vector." Yada 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 yada. Also, and it might have been some, enhanced by some, X Y Z. Yeah, it may have been exacerbated by this as well as that. That would have been fine. But no, the only answer you're going to put in the book is fuck climate change. Like, I'm not trying to be a dick. 
Like, I don't even want to get into like whether it exists or not, whatever. It can exist. That's fine. But it doesn't have to be the boogeyman behind fucking everything all the time. Yeah. It drives me nuts. How I, dare I, you? How dare you? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to keep going. I, now that I've done all the history classes, it's really all I cared to take. And I, I don't know. I feel like I've seen enough. I don't, you know, maybe there was one point where it was like, oh, I could work on, you know, work on textbooks and actually maybe help fix the problem. But like, they're never going to let me anywhere near anything that kids get to read in a public school. Um, it's, and even do the textbooks they have you read are wild. Yeah. That, like I could tell reading uh, my world. I, we had a class just on world war two and like, I, I'm not trying to be a dick, but I knew more about it than the teacher did just cause that's what I focus on for 80 hours a week. And the textbook that we we were required to read, I could tell just from reading it that it was written by a British historian and he like only emphasized what Great Britain did and he downplayed everything America did, which I don't know. It just pissed me off. Like he picked the most non pro American textbook that you could find that was remotely credible. And that was the textbook that, that we had for class. Ladies and gentlemen, that's once again called communism in the American <laughs> school. Oh, system. Fuck. If I have to hear one more person tell me that, you know, the USSR actually took out 80% of the Nazis, and they, America didn't really do a whole lot. I'm going to lose my fucking mind. Well, to be fair, uh, a Nazi killed Hitler, so uh, there, there's some good that came out of that. Let me ask you this. If you were to continue your education, uh, one of the things that, that, that acad academicians do is they narrow down for either their, their th graduate work, they narrow down for their thesis or their dissertation, and you got to go study one thing. I have a first cousin that was is really, really into the Civil War. He, yeah, he was in the movie The North and the South. He was in the movie Gettysburg. He's in full regalia, and he has a PhD in Civil War history, and he went and he is the authority of one small skirmish. Like it got his attention and he went and he spent, he spent five years researching one skirmish. And now whenever the history channel has back when the history channel used to do history, my cousin's head would pop up to talk about the civil war. I know you love world war II, as do I, and at least love the study of if you were to go and do graduate work and have to narrow down and really deep dive one thing, what would it be for you? Uh, I would probably do Vietnam. The final years of Vietnam, like 1972-ish, that era. Um, what, what about that piques your interest? Like, Oh, God. You guys are going to get me in trouble. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just, I think that's, uh, I think that is the moment with uh, the American education system and the general pub public's interpretation of what the U.S. military does really changed. And I don't think it changed for very good reason. And I think there, well, no, I know there's a lot of lying and disingenuous points made that are now just accepted as fact and they don't even make logical sense. So I would love to rip that apart. You mentioned government cheese a few minutes ago. I was watching Jackie Brown last night and in it, Samuel Jack, Samuel L. Jackson, he calls this guy a cheese eater. And, and I knew that came from just saying, Hey, he comes from a bad background. I'm a movie guy through and through, Nick, and you coming from a background of combat medic, we've all watched the field dressings and the combat medic work being done in Band of Brothers. We've all watched Saving Private Ryan. Have you seen a moment in movie history uh, that stands out to you where they actually got it right? Uh, man, I can't remember if it's Saving Private Ryan or if it's... Uh... A lot of those movies, when it comes to medical stuff, actually do a great job. Um, I can't remember if it's Saving Private Ryan or Band of Brothers, but there's one where they're actually showing the guy pouring the... Uh, so, like, in modern times, we have uh, hemostatic impregnated gauze that you would shove into, like, a axillary wound, like, to get shot in the armpit or in the groin, like, somewhere where we couldn't put a tourniquet on it. You would pack it full of uh, this gauze that has an agent that promotes clotting in it. Um, back in the day, they just had like a chemical powder that you would pour on a gunshot wound and it would chemically burn the gunshot shut. And there's one movie, it's in the background, but if you're looking for it, you can see it. 
the medic goes to pour the stuff on and the wind blows and it blows in his eyes and everybody else's eyes. So that, and that was like one of the huge problems with that stuff back in the day is like you're pouring chemicals that burn human flesh out into the air on a windy day on the beach on D day. It's flying everywhere. It's getting in people's eyes. So that was always an interesting one for me. This is the Liberty Lounge. We're joined with the fat electrician, who I must say is neither one of those at the moment. He's looking fantastic. What's next for you, Nick? What's coming down the road for you? Uh, right now, just keep making YouTube videos. I mean, it's not a, I don't know. I guess I don't have anything big on the horizon. Maybe more live shows with the unsubscribed podcast, but um, I don't think I have anything big. I mean, unless you're asking for like future video ideas, that's about... <laughs> As far as that as I plan, I, I live it kind of one week at a time. Oh, I can steal them. Love it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Jared, favorite part of history? Ooh, favorite part of history. What 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 turns your crank? For me, I'll go first. I love the Peloponnese, the Peloponnesian Wars. I have read a a metric boatload, no pun intended, on the Peloponnese, and it gets me. Like it just gets my attention. I freaking love that stuff. For me, uh, growing up in the Boston area, it's everything that happened leading up to the revolution and the you know the first shots. Is that the Cultural Revolution in the sixties? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I like seeing Battle Green and the Old North Church, Old North Church, Old North Bridge, uh, everything about that area, um, the area where uh, Paul Revere was caught. That whole part of our history for me is is just awe inspiring. Anthony, same question, and we'll get you out of here. What is your favorite part of history? What gets you? the end i was doing a lot of courses like on um on athens like actual greek athens and all that um battle of thermopylae uh sparta their growth over time that was really really interesting i i would like to put more time into that and dig a little bit deeper into that stuff i just haven't had time um so that 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 was really intriguing me at the end nick i think your answer is probably going to be world war ii but can you narrow it down a little bit more what really like when you find yourself getting lost in the chapters what's getting you uh two things that i get pumped about about world war ii is um it's it's just the opposite of what everybody else likes so everybody focuses on the european theater i prefer the pacific theater uh in particular i really like uh the navy like naval operations in World War II, I thought were super impressive. And then overall, uh, just the industrial manufacturing might that America had. Uh, when you start looking at the sheer volume of food and equipment and everything that the people back home were able to produce, uh, that's what fascinates me. I think that's because uh, I was an industrial electrician, so I worked in factories uh, for, you know, my whole electrical career. And I can't imagine, well, I guess like, you know, it's, everybody's just showing up to go to work at a factory. They punch the clock and do whatever, but I can't imagine showing up to work one day and everybody's, everybody's all on board about doing the best job they possibly can because their kids or their friends, kids or their dads or whoever is off fighting the war and they're going to need this stuff. So I think that's the part that fascinates me the most. However you found us, we're glad that you did. This is the Liberty Lounge podcast. We've been joined today by combat medic, historian, podcaster, YouTuber, and jujitsu grandmaster. I don't know the right oh word boy. for that, but he does <laughs> like to crack some skulls. Thanks for finding us here. Everybody wave us out. See you next time.